Kicker Weekly is a three-episode in anime discussion podcast where two brothers discuss a show of their choice. The show can be anything from a current season flop to a decades-old classic. What are they going to talk about next? Who knows? They sure don't. I'm Andrew. I'm Lee. And this is Whitaker Weekly. Let's get right to it. All right, we've got a number of things in the news this week. Yeah, we do. Um, It was announced at Comic-Con that uh, Usagi Yojimbo has an animated series in development. Wow, that's an old manga. Usagi Yojimbo, really? Yeah. Um, Ah. Now, I was actually interested in this because I looked up the studio that uh, has the... uh, um, that, that's working on it. It's uh, Animation. Gal- Galmont Animation. Uh-huh. I looked up their catalog, and they have a lot of children's shows, a lot of interesting animation that I just I haven't ever had the chance to watch, but it doesn't really interest me. But then I saw their catalog of scripted live action work, mm-hmm. which included a lot of gritty realism um, shows. Uh, Narc, I think, was one of them. But the one that really caught my eye, the one that I've actually watched, was uh, they did Hannibal. Really? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, if there's any crossover between some of their, you know, gritty, serious live action work in their animated departments, then this thing has the potential of being pretty amazing. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I mean, they did other, the Redwall series. Animated. Okay. Hmm? Sorry, I was saying they did re- they did the Redwall series. I have yes. not seen it, but I know a ton of people who love those books. Oh yeah. So uh, my wife has a handful of the Redwall books on our bookshelf. Okay. Huh. I'll have to check that out. Cool. That's exciting, and we have some other news as well. Do um, Kyo Animation, uh, Kyoto Animation, Kyo Annie published their first trailer after the fire, which features. Violet Evergarden Gaiden, which means uh, Gaiden apparently means side story. Uh huh. So uh, they're looking at, and so I haven't watched it yet. I'm planning on it, but um, yeah, just just yesterday they dropped. Uh, just on Tuesday they dropped uh, the Violet Evergarden uh, Ev- Violet Evergarden Gaiden trailer. Nice. I so. wonder if that's going to be. I wonder if that's going to be the third novel because the series was the first two, mm. and the novel's the third. And I, it was confirmed. I checked um, that uh, the movie for Konosuba is going to be the fifth light novel because the first two seasons are the first four books. Okay. Um, and the movie is going to be the fifth one. The fifth one focuses a lot on Megumin's family, and uh-huh. they go to her hometown for a little bit, and the, okay. and that's what happens in book five. I okay. haven't started reading it yet. I just got five and six in the mail because I'm <laughs> close to finishing four. Mm. Um, well, by close to fishing for me, about a third through it, but they're like they're super short books. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, the other item that I have written down is, um, apparently, it was, some people knew this and uh, some people didn't, but uh, famed British author Neil Gaiman was uh, basically uh, was recommended by Quentin Tarantino to write the Princess Mononoke. Dub script, which holy crap! I mean, I mean yeah. this guy. I mean this guy. I mean I, he's he's kind of gone onto my radar recently based on a lot of the, his works being made uh-huh. into shows. I mean, he wrote Coraline and uh, mm-hmm, Good mm-hmm. Omens, which is the new David Tennant. Uh, I haven't series. watched that yet, but it's got such crazy good reviews. From everybody, everyone who's online who I've seen talk about it, they're just like, this is so amazing. You guys have to watch this. Apparently he also wrote uh, American Gods. Uh-huh. And uh, he's most famous for uh, a, a comic series called The Sandman. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he, he's done work for... Um, oh, he did work for DC for a time. Yeah. And apparently... Um, 
he wrote a character that's basically Lucifer in DC Comics mm -hmm. and insisted that he look exactly like he be the character be designed based on David Bowie. Oh, jeez. And so David Bowie is a DC character and is technically the most powerful DC character. That's awesome. So David Bowie can beat Superman. But no, apparently he... Uh, uh, so the Princess Mononoke um, got, uh, was, uh, uh, the translation for it fell to Miramax Studios. Uh -huh, and yeah. Miramax was really happy with Quentin Tarantino's work at the time and knew that uh -huh. he was a big fan of anime and asked him to write the dub. Um, and, but for whatever reason, Tarantino was busy or something, but he, he recommended Neil Gaiman and that, and uh, so apparently... Gaiman wrote the script, uh, wrote like five, like five treatments or something, the different possibilities of the way, way to, to tell the story and write the script out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they liked it and then didn't get back to him for six months and tried to shorten the script so that they would, so to uh, match lip flap. Yeah. And then got him back six months later to, to finalize the script while matching lip flap. Mm-hmm. So though, uh, oh man, yeah, that that's I mean, so cool. And but apparently, I, I, but Princess Mononoke, uh, apparently, you know, when it came to America, th there's a legend that uh, I don't know exactly whether it was. I think it when it came to America, and there was a question about whether or not uh, there any of the graphic violence would have to be edited out. That mm -hmm. apparently, um, Hayao Miyazaki shipped a katana to the editor and said, "No cuts." Yeah, yeah. Have you heard this legend? I have heard that legend, but ah, oh, that's that's so cool. I mean, no, I just I adore Princess Mononoke, and I adore the '90s dub of it. And you know, here, you know, people have heard me talk about how much I prefer subs and things like that, sure. especially on this show. But the dub for Princess Mononoke was top notch it really was uh, they had a list it was so good it was packed with a-listers uh -huh. incredibly well written and now it makes sense why it was so well written it's because it was neil gaiman who did the trend did the writing for it apparently though wow. <laughs> apparently though um he wasn't on the posters that that was no, the big that was, was a big conspiracy yeah. is that um he wasn't on the posters because um Studio Ghibli wanted as wanted as many of the original credits as physically possible mm -hmm. on the posters, so that people knew who originally made it, who originally animated it, wrote it, who originally starred in it, um, and just wanted. And you know, Neil Gaiman wasn't in a position, contractually speaking, that they were they weren't required to put his name on the poster, so they didn't. And so he didn't get. Uh, so while he's credited and it's his work. He wasn't, you know, it wasn't advertised that it was his work at the time. Yeah, I mean, and that makes sense to me as well, because in the 90s, you know, anime was nowhere near as prevalent as it is now. It's true. Um, this, was, this was the first big Miyazaki movie that came over to the States. I mean, we have the the horrendous it was, it, it version of now of the valley of the winds but yeah i saw this in theaters back with yeah. will and a bunch of our other friends from high school and like yeah i was just blown away with how incredible it was, yeah, it was um amazing. and uh i mean akira and uh, uh, really opened the door uh -huh. but princess mononoke opened the floodgates uh -huh. of what was what yeah internationally coming well, over here i i don't know if it opened the floodgates but it definitely was the beginning of something mm -hmm. um but uh so, uh, what was I trying to say? Um, I, I lost my train of thought. Anyways, no. Sorry about uh, that. But yeah, Princess Mononoke is probably my favorite Ghibli movie. And like I said, the 90s dub is just incredible. If you guys haven't seen it yet, go ahead and do yourselves a favor. And it, it might, hold on, let me, I'll be right back. Let me check something. All right. All right. So while he's going and grabbing that, um, be sure to check us out on uh, Facebook and Twitter. And if you have any uh, suggestions for uh, anime that we can watch in the future, you let us know.
I have here the original. Let me hold up to the camera real fast. Uh -huh. um, this is the Miramax release of the 90s, the DVD, Princess uh -huh. Mononoke. And, yeah, his name is not on it at all, which, you know, but like we said, that makes sense. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. Um, it, was the, it was the beginning of kind of the anime movement, I guess, kind mm -hmm. of in the 90s or so, something along those lines. Yeah. So if they had put Neil Gaiman's name on it back when before people really knew about Studio Ghibli and Hayao Miyazaki um, and all the incredible artists that went, in, went into it, they probably would have just assumed that Neil Gaiman was the one who created it all. Mm. Uh, it was rich it was his original work so to me it makes sense that neil gaiman is not on that um no right. i have no idea like i guess it doesn't say anything maybe it says something here oh let me go ahead and hold this up this is the miyazaki blu-ray collection mm -hmm. that i got from from amazon um prime day this is all of miyazaki's films from right. um, up until when he retired for the third time <laughs> um hold on my screen just went weird on me there we go okay. that's better that's better okay so there's totoro mm -hmm. i don't know i guess i'll have to watch i guess i'll probably have to watch it Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this Blu-ray is just an upscaled version of the original Miramax release or mm -hmm. Miramax release. Oh, no, 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 no. It's got the same voice actors. It's got Julian Anderson, Billy Crudup, Claire Danes, Minnie Driver, mm -hmm. Bob Thornton, Jada Pinkett Smith. So okay. I assume that means that it is an upscaled <laughs> version of the original Miramax release. Anyways, yeah, that anyways, sounds right. Um, yeah. And one last bit of news before we go into three episodes in. Huge, what did you find out today? Huge, huge, huge news. Not just me. Like, Twitter went ballistic with the news, but they have revealed the cast of the Edmonds Fielders, the people from the Two Rivers, in the Wheel of Time series from, uh, from, from Amazon. And oh man, am I excited! I mean, they're all they're all new newish actors. Um, mm -hmm. I looked them up on IMDb. They don't really have too many credits to their names. Um, but, uh, they're all fresh young faces and that makes sense. This series is something that's going to run for eight to 10 years. Easy. Sure. Um, and, uh, so they want to go ahead and, you know, get actors that they don't have to pay that much for. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they, they announced, they showed the new cast and the, the, the guy who's playing Perrin, who's one of my favorite characters, um, Rafe Judkins, I think his last name is Judkins. Forgive me if I'm getting it wrong. He tweeted saying that when he did the reading for Perrin, there was not a single dry eye in the room. Uh, and as soon as he walked out, he just turned to them and said, that's our Perrin. Yeah. So I'm super excited for it. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find a good place where I can put this. I'll just put this over here for now. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I'm super excited for it. Uh, filming begins in September, which is, you know, less than a month away for us. So, yeah. uh, all right. Anyways, that's it for news. Uh, we talked a bit longer about news than we usually do. Um, but let's go ahead and just get into three episodes in now. Fantastic. And this week, it was my pick. And I picked uh, Tamako Market. Tom Tamako. and I, we watched this. We watched this on H Dive, and we got the description from H Dive as well. So this is what it says. Tamako knows everything about mochi, the traditional Japanese dessert treats. She even works at Tamaya, her family's mochi shop. However, friendships, rivalries, and strange new feelings are beginning to make her life a sticky, complicated mess. Mm. Um, and in short, this is another, you know, Kill Annie uh, show. This is, you know, our third show for our Kill Annie month here. Mm. Um, and again, this is just cute girls doing cute things pretty much. Um, this is kind of where they like. I don't know if this is where they started introducing twists, but there is a twist to it. This isn't just this is just isn't just K O N, where it's just cute girls playing instruments. Mm -hmm. There is kind of a uh, a fantasy twist to it. Um, yes, <laughs> they, they, they've introduced a Mokona type character into this show. Mokona, um, she's a uh, a clamp um, creation, mostly from Subasa. Was just this cute little meat bun of a uh, of a uh, fantasy creature, a little, little bit like a Moogle, um, but had had bizarre abilities. 
that for whatever reason, like it could speak, and then it also had like a a projector that comes out of its forehead. Mm-hmm. That's what Mokana is, and so. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, long story short, I enjoyed this. I felt that it was it's only a twelve episode series, so I'll probably be watching the entire thing um, when I have time to. Hmm. But the characters I felt were cute enough. Uh, well, cute. Intri- intriguing enough, I guess I want to say. Um, yeah. Then again, intriguing really isn't the right word either. They are, uh, they're fun. That's probably the best word I'm looking for. The characters are fun in it so far. Um, yes. But anyways, let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so, so the first episode kind of starts off with uh, things going back and forth between the main character and this scene of a bird falling asleep among a field of flowers and mm-hmm. sleeping so deeply that the flowers start growing up around the bird. And eventually there's a harvest that happens. And this is all intercut with some other things happening with our main Mm -hmm. character, Tamako. And Tamako, uh, she is coming home with her friends. um, And uh, she's a cheery, bright young girl. Um, I didn't catch if they... I think they're in high school. Um, Yeah. but, But at the same time... Yeah, yeah, they're in high school. I think she, I think she's a first year. I don't think they ever actually said anything, um, but uh, or said what year they're in. But uh, anyways, she and her friends are having a fun time going home, and they have they're doing some games where like they'll skip across openings to like avoid stepping in the sunlight uh, between buildings and whatnot. Yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll try to leap mm-hmm. across the beam of light as if like the floor is lava or something. And she and uh, she does something like that as well. And she's about to keep going when her two friends grab her and point out to her that she just ran past her home. She got so yeah. caught up into having fun with her friends that she missed uh, she missed her turn, pretty much. Yep. And then she walks into her home, and her home is, uh, well, not to her home, but she walks into the neighborhood where she lives, and she lives yes. in an arcade. And an arcade is not, you know... It's not... It's means something different in japan it doesn't yeah. necessarily mm-hmm. mean a, a building full of video games that mm-hmm. you can play mm-hmm. it's not a building full of arcade cabinets where you can play video games in japan an arcade is a a a, a street or like a couple of blocks of sh- stores and usually yeah. families will live in those stores in the front like the bottom level front area will be like let's say this well i'm not i, I guess that doesn't really work um mm-hmm. but bottom area Usually, when you come into an American home, the living room's right there. Mm-hmm. In here, when you come in, instead of it being the living room, it will be the shop. Yes, um, and, and a lot of these yeah. shops they're they're street facing, wide open. You know, you just go, you just walk up to them and order what you're getting. It's it's kind of like a uh, kind of like a food court. Yeah, mm-hmm. you don't have to go yeah. into the, you don't have to go into the shop too much. Yeah, well, it's 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 like a marketplace. So. Yeah. Uh, most of their stuff is kind of out in the open, but like there's like I never caught the person's name, but the guy who has the long blonde hair and looks feminine. Yeah. Um in all the artwork, I thought it was a woman, but it's definitely a man with that voice. With that voice um, yeah. And he uh he runs the flower shop. So you would go into his placing at the flower shops, but other places okay. like vegetable stores and whatnot, or candy yeah, places, they, they, they'll they have, have display case right there. I think there's like a meat store there as well. Yeah, I thought there was a butcher shop. Um, definitely, there's a place that makes croquets. Mm. Um, the 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 fried Japanese uh, potato treat. Um, it's like the, they're bigger, softer versions of McDonald's hash browns. Yes, and sometimes they'll have things inside of them. Uh, anyways, um, um, well, before she even walks into there, I mean, as one of the introductions to this entire arcade is. After her friends say, okay, this is where you go. We'll see you later. She says, see you later. She throws her baton up <laughs> in the right. air. I wrote that down. Spins I by, it. it spins up in the air. way like She throws it up like three stories. Mm-hmm. And it spins right by the sign that's identifying this place, this market that uh, that is where she lives. And then the thing lands square on the top of her head. The baton mm-hmm. straight down right on the top of her head. Mm-hmm. Like oh, um, 
then we're introduced to a couple of interesting characters who are um, Tamako's father and the neighbor across the way. Um, and, are we and they're like at a constant rivalry with each other. Are we introduced to them first, or does the bird show up first? Um, but she's in the, the flower bird, shop. That's right. She, which, goes into the, she does go into the flower mm-hmm. shop, and she lo- sees the bird amidst a bouquet of flowers, and the bird latches Ooh, onto her. Hey, residents. Yeah. The bird latches onto her face, and she expels the bird from her face with an incredibly loud sneeze. <laughs> Which apparently in bird language, being sneezed upon is a way that a female bird shows an interest in a male. And then the male will fluff his plumage. Oh, and my, my daughter pointed this out to me is just how much like Yuga Aoyama, the oh, nasal you, laser the naval laser boy from My Hero Academia that this bird. Oh, did you watch like. this with Jasmine then? Yeah, I watched the first episode with Jasmine. Gotcha. And just how how his face and his poses reminded her so much of this guy. Like this mm-hmm. is clearly a trope that of people who think themselves very fancy. Yeah. And he's very this bird has a very high opinion of himself. Yes. A very high opinion. Which um, makes me wonder if there's like a character or in a in an older work that these guys are kind of parodying. As the as they're playing these fancy characters, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to go ahead and look it up on uh, on that trope site, whatever it's called. It's not trope stuff. T- hey, there is tropes dot com, isn't it? Yeah. TV. Tro- I don't remember if it's dot com or dot org, but it's TV tropes something. Dot org. TV tropes dot org. There it is. Okay. But no, there might be okay. some history behind that because their their behavior is so similar. There might be some shared history to that. Mm-hmm. Um. But no, we're, so the bird immediately takes a liking to her and starts riding around on her head. Yeah, and yeah. That's and that's when, well, and that's I think she's heading home with the bird on her head when she runs into uh-huh. the childhood friend oh. whose name is Mochizu. Mochizu. Well, before that, she goes around doing her errands and like everyone in this in this arcade, they're like a big family. They look out for each other. They help each other out. Each other. She buys things from them, but you know sometimes they'll just hand her free stuff because you know she's part of the community. And the yeah. entire time they're just like, "Oh, is that a new bird? Did you get a new bird? No, not really. It's just kind of tagging along." She's like, "No," and she's got like tears, and this bird will not get off her head. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then her dad and her childhood friend's dad both own rival mochi shops uh-huh. that are right across the street from each other, and this is a point of contention for them. A real big one. Her dad is very, very traditional. This is mochi. This is what it is. This is a tradition. We don't need to make new things. We just need to stick with the old. It's good enough as it is. Whereas Mochizu's dad Mm -hmm. is very, very modern. He gave his place an English name. um, And he's rice cake. Rice cake something or other. Which is not what we call mochi in English. He's wrong about that, by the way. We call it mochi. We don't say rice cake. Rice cakes are a completely different thing. We we have a thing called rice cakes. It's basically puffed rice pressed into a disc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are our rice cakes. And when I was when I was a kid, man, one of my favorite snacks was rice cakes with peanut butter on top. Uh, I mm. love those things. But anyways, uh, my family uh, had gluten free. We had a lot of rice cake based foods, including mm-hmm. uh, learning how to make what are called cheese toasties. It's just Ooh. you put in a, you put a layer of cheese on over the rice cake and sit it under a broiler until the cheese melts. Ooh, yeah. And you could, you could also put a layer of. Um, you know, you, uh, pre-sliced sandwich meat on top of that as well. You might want to try a recipe that I came across. Um, it's uh, it's just uh, pepperoni chips. Okay. You just put pepperoni in an oven under a boiler, un- under the broiler, and let it crisp up for a little bit, and then bring it out and eat it as chips. Simple Ooh. as that. Though, on a variant on that recipe is you set the oven to, I think, 350, 375. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. You don't want it too high. And you put in, um, you put in pepperoni, but you you pair them up like clumps of three, kind of like okay. after they're rather triangle shaped. Uh-huh. After five minutes, when they're nice and cooked, you're, they're going to pop apart just because that's pepperoni and stuff that's going to fly all over the place. Um, put them back together, and then put little bits of mozzarella on top of them. 
put them back in the oven and just let it be there for a couple minutes, keeping an eye on it. And then as soon as the mozzarella is golden, pull it out and then let it cool off. And you've got yourself some nice pepperoni chips with mozzarella on them. All right. Yeah, they're real good. I've been I've been doing keto and like a variant on keto and stuff like that, and I absolutely mm-hmm. adore that snack. But anyways, uh, let's get back to the food in here. And her, yeah, I guess the two dads are having this massive battle between each other. Well, massive battle, like they're yeah. arguing and they're, it's close to coming to blows. They've grabbed each other, and the son Mochi's was just like, "Wait, wait come on, stop, 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 stop!" And she, Tamako, is so used to this. That she's just like, uh, excuse me. And in Japan, like when they're trying to get through a line, they just go, uh, excuse me, say, excuse me, you know, type thing. Just kind of uh-huh. lower their head. I'm being rude, but I'm trying to get through type thing. You know, I'm not trying to take your spot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just kind of use, like, kind of wave their hand like this to try to get through crowds. And she kind of does that. And uh, <laughs> the dad split and make room for her. But I, I think they're, while their hands are still <laughs> grabbing each other, they move for her. And she moves through. And their arms hit the bird. Knocks it off her head. And she doesn't think, oh, the bird. She goes, oh, hey, my head's suddenly a lot lighter. <laughs> oh, my head's gotten light. Yes. And the bird's just kind of collapsed on the floor. Oh, that bird. Um, mm-hmm. But, <laughs> yeah, one of, the, one of the little things that is said is that, um, you know, <laughs> Even though these families have been in this particular arcade or something for generations, mm-hmm. like I think it, I think it's established that, that Tamako, yeah, started, yeah, Tamako's yeah. great grandfather um, started this yeah. business. It's like, but technically, while, while Tamako, the neighbor across the way, has been there longer. Mm-hmm. And so he tries to throw, you know, he tries to throw his weight around as being the, being the store with seniority. The other guy's like, you got here three days before us. Mm-hmm. Don't give me that seniority stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, they, Which... they've, been, they, they've been there for three generations. Mm-hmm. You got here three days before us. Don't throw around the seniority stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's been six generations now because grandfathers well they've been in the business yoke the mochi business for six generations now um because her grandfather's grandfather so that's three plus another three. Oh, okay so yeah so it's six generations well six. and she's not running the business Even but every so, morning she gets the a three day mm-hmm. difference is the big yeah yeah <laughs> you got here three days before we did <laughs> yeah uh. But yeah, so huh. so we're we're clearly interested in that the childhood friend relationship between uh, Mochizo and uh, Tamako. Yep, yep. And like they bring the bird, they rush the bird inside because they were worried the bird's been hurt. And Mochizu comes in, uh-huh. and Mochizu refers to Tamako's dad as father. Yes, and he gets he, mad every single time. He does not like that. That yeah. one. It's like, don't you call me dad. Don't you call me father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, then, but... It, it's at that point, the bird recovers. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody's like, this is such a weird bird. Why is it talking? Yeah, this <laughs> bird is talking. And uh, the the bird's talking. Yeah, yeah. And uh, everyone's freaked out by it. And like, it even goes to Anko, the little, the, the youngest girl who's come home as well. Mm-hmm. And she just looks at the bird and says, Kimochi wari, which means, oh, that's gross. You know, <laughs> because the bird's up there posing and being like trying to be dignified, and it's just oh. creeping everybody out. He, but, he's standing like a he's standing like a model with his leg one leg behind the other, but crossed ankles mm-hmm. really far mm-hmm. crossed ankles that causes an accentuation of the legs. Um, and and will walk like a uh, a model going down the runway deliberately. Mm-hmm. Um. But we find out as that um, the bird's name, the bird announces what his name is, which is Dera Mochi Mazui, <laughs> which apparently translates to Mochi is nasty. Dera Mochi Mazui. Yeah. Mazui which... is like gross. Oh, disgusting. <laughs> like, Kimochi Warui is like when you get a gross feeling from somebody else, uh-huh. whereas Mazui means disgusting flavor or taste. 
<laughs> so when you eat some, you go, ah, Missouri, you know, and it's just gross. So his name means their line of business is making nasty food. Yeah. Your food and, is and disgusting. So, and, and so he says that's his name. It's like, what did you say in my house? Oh, that my name is Dinner Mochi Mosi. Don't you say that Mochi is nasty. <laughs> he throws the bird out the door. <laughs> Oh, gosh. But, like, one of the silly things about this show is that the bird talks. Mm -hmm. And literally everybody's just like, oh, this bird talks. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's it's not, like, they just kind of take it in stride. They're just, nobody really freaks out about it. Like, maybe one or two people will be like, wait, what? oh, whoa, weird, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's not like anybody's freaking out, let's call the police, this bird's an alien, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, some people would be in, or, you know, right. other people would be trying to exploit it to make tons of money. Everyone in this community is just like, oh, it's just a talking bird. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, this is our new reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, uh, what appears to be a cross-dressing um, mm -hmm. florist. So they're totally cool mm -hmm. with all kinds of things mm -hmm. that happen in anime. Well, they uh, spend the next. Uh, I think it's this episode. They um, they go to the bath, uh -huh. the bath, the local bathhouse. Um, the two girls, and on their they way out, it, they on... call it rabbit bath because there's rabbit motifs in the bathhouse. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, the two girls go to it, and just as um, they're about to enter, mm -hmm. um, they run into uh, Mochizo, who uh, is leaving. And he says, oh, no, I just got here as well. And uh, <laughs> Tomic was just like, oh, really? Because your hair is all wet. That usually <laughs> means you've gotten just out of the bath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're about to go in. And uh, he stops the bird from joining them. Well, the, the bird was following along. And apparently uh, it's really cold outside because it's getting oh, late that's right, here. That's right, that's right. And the bird is freezing. He's like, mm -hmm. let's go in where it's warm. And they go in. And the guy war and uh, Machizo warns Dara, the bird, that if you don't want to be thrown out in the cold, keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. What? I have to give up who I am? If you want to be cold, you can be. You can do what you want. And then the owners are just like, "Wait, are you talking to that bird? It's been a childhood dream of mine to talk to animals." And the bird introduces himself immediately, just to. Just completely mm -hmm. ignores all of the advice he was given before. And the old man loves it. Absolutely mm -hmm. loves talking to this bird. So this mm -hmm. bird's allowed to walk in and he's running around the men's side of the bath and he's loving the smells and the warmth and it's great. And then he hears that there's girls on the other side. And he goes and flies, and they're, and they're separated by a wall, but the wall doesn't reach all the way to the ceiling. No, mm -mm. which isn't unusual. It's that's not unusual for bathhouses in Japan. I mean, you got you have all that steam. You need to let the steam escape. You can't let it get trapped. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you start building up mold. Um, but that said, uh, so so the bird flies up and looks over. Uh, the area and we see the bird with a bloody nose Cause, but because he hears the girls talking about like washing each other's backs and things like that and the bird gets a perverted look on his face and Mo Mo Mochizo's just like uh uh don't you dare but he goes up anyways yes he does he goes up and he what all we see is we see Tamako and her sister uh Anko getting dressed Mm -hmm. uh, fi completely finishing getting dressed. Mm -hmm. And the bird falls down and <laughs> well, Tomiko the... has, no has, has no compunction picking this bird up and throwing it right back over to the boy's side. And it's such a cute little toss. It's not like a hurl. She picks it up and just kind of eh, lobs it over, you know? <laughs> but I think w one thing that we didn't mention that I really want to mention is uh -huh. how the bird has a bird accurate nosebleed. Like, yeah. like it, like it comes out of the beak. It, in the, it comes, the it comes the out of the where the nostril is on the where it would be on the beak. Yeah. <laughs> so he goes up there. He looks in. He sees the girls talking, and he gets a nosebleed coming out from right where the blood the the nostril, the nostril is on the beak, or would be on the beak. 
<laughs> so I appreciated that it was an accurate nosebleed for the bird. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's always nice when something like that happens. <laughs> when so, attention to detail like that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, now, something about uh, the sister. I don't know where exactly this happens uh-huh. um, in in what's in the overall thing. I didn't write it down, but uh, there's a scene where, as it turns out, Tomiko's little sister, Anko, just wants to be called On. Doesn't want to have the co in her name anymore. It's like, but the onco is cute. Like, I don't like it. I want to just be called on. And the f- only person to call her on was the bird. It's like, the weird bird called me what I wanted to be called. Uh. And it freaked her out so much. She's just like, no, I don't like, I don't like this. I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor girl. Uh. Uh, but okay, so they, they, they finish up the bath, and um, uh, I don't, don't remember much about what else happens in the first three episodes, really. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen. Um, we're introduced to... Um, oh, that's right. Uh, Tomiko has a birthday that comes up in one of the episodes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Mochizo gets berated for having... Over all the years that they've known each other, he's never given her a birthday present. And is this mm-hmm. the year she's going to finally get me a, birth- a birthday present? Mm-hmm. Well, later in the episode, he opens up this drawer next to his bed, and there are, are a dozen wrapped presents in there. And I have to think, did he get her a birthday present every year, and he's just failed to deliver it? And so he's just too embarrassed? So he just has a collection of failed birthday presents? Sitting in his in a drawer in his bedroom. Huh, yeah, <laughs> probably. Probably. I mean, like, I don't. I mean, given their relationship. Yeah. Well, he, and he's like, clearly we... he's clearly smitten with her, but she seems like she's too free spirited to notice if somebody even has interest in her. Uh, free-spirited, um, otherwise known as dense. <laughs> uh, it just reminds me of Sound Euphonium, where um, the main girl and her childhood friend, um, you know, it, it was obvious that they liked each other. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they also... I don't know. I, I like. Uh, I I see a comparison there, but I'm trying. I'm I'm having problems putting it to words. Mm. Um, well, the guy likes her. He upset her uh, oh. before the show begins, and he, uh, you know, he wants to make up for it. But she, you know, is keeping him at arm's distance because you know she thought that's what he wanted. Right. Um, and obviously, she's upset at him. Um, but anyways, whereas in this one, yeah, he likes her, but he doesn't know how to express it. Right. He's too, he's too scared to express it. And there's just, there's the slightest hint of a Romeo and Juliet thing going on with the rivalry between their parents. Oh, 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 real fast. Uh, did we ever mention why the bird is actually here? Um, no, it it is. We did. I haven't mentioned it. So let's go Um, ahead and bring that. Let's go ahead and bring that up. The bird's on a journey to find the princess who's supposed to marry the prince of his home country. Yes. Now he's the, the, the bird is so fancy. And so in, in such a way, like he immediately assumes anybody who sneezes on him is, is, uh, attempting to, um, flirt with him. And three girls sneeze on him. One's allergic to him. Uh-huh. And the other two, he lands on their faces. So of course they're going to sneeze on him. Yeah. He tickles her nose with his feathers. Yeah. That's a completely natural response. Um, and, and so, yeah, so he just feels the need to perch and preen around them as a uh, a way of reciprocating. But mm-hmm. he eventually falls... He act- but yeah, he, he doesn't clearly communicate that he's searching for a girl for a prince in his country. In fact... He it makes it sound like he's on a quest for a girl for himself because the way he acts, he might think he's the prince. Mm, and yeah. so there's a scene where uh, Tamako recommends they go to a pet store. He says, well, there'll be lots of girls there for you, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<sighs> okay. Uh, so yeah, since we since we since we covered that, the uh, bird spends the night at Mochizo's place. Um, yep. and we see um. Tomoko gets up, helps her family with the daily making of preparing of mochi to be sold that day. Yeah, she gets up was, at like four. Yeah, she gets up really early, and it was something adorable about the way her uh, her, her her morning routine is: is she wears glasses to go to the bathroom, but then puts contact lenses in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we find out that she uh, she wears contacts that way. I mean, it's just a very quick little. She puts the glasses on. And then there's a shot of a contact lens case next to other toiletries, mm-hmm. and she's not wearing the glasses anymore. And so it's very quick, easy to miss, but it's just a little bit of character development that uh, they threw in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's just it's just kind of a cute uh, morning routine that she's going through. Um, anyways, um, she, uh, she, <laughs> one thing that I wrote down, and I thought, how smart is that? Um her sister on is just kind of sitting there half asleep underneath the kotatsu. And um so Tomoko is also making breakfast for everybody. This is by the way, this episode is the Valentine's episode. Yes. And her grandfather made her a heart-shaped mochi for Valentine's. Aww. And she is she's like grandpa and she just gets embarrassed for it. And it's like grandpa just kind of smiles and whatnot. But anyways. She then makes breakfast, and she's like, oh, well, maybe I'll go ahead and put this mochi in somebody's miso soup. I'll give it to Dad for his Valentine well, for Valentine's Day, you know? Uh-huh. Um, and as she's making breakfast, she turns around, and she sees Anko, or An, uh-huh. sitting underneath the kotatsu. Uh, kotatsu, for those of you who don't know what it is, it is a table that has a thick blanket around the edges, mm-hmm. and usually a blanket underneath. And mm-hmm. underneath it, there is a stove. And that stove makes the inside of that area incredibly warm. It is warm. It is comfortable. I have sat in them before. They are great. Um, and I'm reminded of uh, Kazuma uh, having having some technology of having wishes granted for them. And so he just wishes for a kotatsu. Uh, he... he, he... Or or gets or, or what is it? Does he, get, does he get whiz to build it or how? He, how? he makes it himself, and he gets ah. uh, he gets. Um, so uh, whiz is terrible at business, and uh-huh. if you recall correctly, um, her demon general friend, huh? And then she orders things that never sell. She orders things that never sell. She always orders things that orders things that never sells. Uh, they are constantly in the red. Um, and her demon friend that possesses um, that possesses. Uh, uh, darkness at the end of the first arc of yeah, the, mask, two. the masked demon, mask guy. I can't remember what his name is right now. It's it's the part that I'm reading right now in the books. Uh-huh. Um, he after he's destroyed, uh, he comes back in his second life, and he's got Roman numeral two on his head now. Um, and he uh has taken up residence with Wiz because they're old friends, mm-hmm. and he is going to help her succeed in business. Uh, what, because while she is an incredible mage, she is awful at business. And so he makes a deal with Cosmo, where Cosmo is going to make these things from his other world because this, this demon see, is, can see all. So he knows that that Aqua is actually a goddess and that mm. Cosmo is from Japan mm. and he has all this knowledge of other things from Japan. And so Cosmo gets levels up a little bit and he gets some basic blacksmithing skills and he uses those skills to make a kotatsu. Mm-hmm. And Instead of it being powered by gas, it's powered by magic. You just put a little bit of magic into it, and it mm. starts warming up. And yeah, he refuses to get out of it <laughs> yeah. because it's so warm. But yeah, that's uh, that's the little bit where uh, Cosma and they Aqua throw start... him out the second story window while he's still under it, as I recall. Yep. yep. But uh, Cosma and Aqua start be- acting like uh, hoity-toity rich people uh-huh. uh, because of how much money they think they're going to make from. Uh, from selling the Kotatsus. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Either 300 million heirs, which is what they called their money in that world, uh-huh. or 100,000 a month for as long as they sell them. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, Cosmo's just like, I'm set. <laughs> Megumi's like, wait. He's like, okay, look, fine, whatever. Your invention's sold. That's great. It's warm now. Winter's over. Let's go on an adventure. And Cosmo's just like, why? That's for people without money to do. <laughs> <laughs> And while Megumin's getting more and more frustrated, Darkness is just like, 
Actually, I kind of want to see how far his depravity is going to go if he keeps getting richer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darkness. Oh, yes, she's great. Uh, of course, when we're talking about Kotatsu, I'm reminded that um, uh, Tamaki from uh, Oran High School Host Club uh -huh. thinks um, that a, uh, a Kotatsu is synonymous with a happy family life. That if you don't have that, if you had a Kotatsu, you had a happy family life, and if you didn't, then you didn't. And so the reason he befriended the the Shadow King character mm -hmm. was because he had never had a Kotatsu, and so was, so he took pity on him. Was oh, you've never had a happy family life. Well, you can be we can be family together. Wow, I so, do not remember that bit from uh, from Oran High School. It's it's, it's, uh, it's a brief like uh -huh. five. Of an, of an episode mm -hmm. but it's uh it's pretty funny because once again <laughs> Tomaki has no idea how actual people relate to each other nope uh so anyways um back to the kotatsu yeah uh she's telling her sister to get up get ready for school and anko's just like fine and she feels something underneath and she pulls out her sister's uniform she's like sister don't put your uniform underneath the kotatsu I just thought to myself, that's genius. It really is. She knows that she's going to have to wear it to school, and it's cold out. Why put on cold clothing when you can put on warm clothing? Le legitimately, I have, in the house I'm living in, there's a heat lamp in my bathroom. And uh -huh. I will hang up the clothes I'm going to wear for the day under that heat lamp and run it on cold mornings. So, yeah. It's a brilliant idea. Um, but anyway, she makes it to school, and it's Valentine's Day is approaching, mm -hmm. and she's got a little sketchbook designing possible mochi layouts for uh, making heart-shaped mm -hmm. mochi. When oh. a friend of hers comes up with an entire like a roll that's a blueprint, and what is this roll? Yeah, what she's just like, here. It's like, well, her friend comes up. She's exhausted. She's like, I was up all, side, all, all night. Sorry, I thought I felt Toby uh, sniffing my leg. Um, uh, her friend was up all night. Uh, it's like, I was all, all up all night designing. What, what were you designing? Uh, can I spread this out? Oh, sure, sure, sure. And she pulls her uh, her stuff away. And, or Tomiko puts her stuff away. And her friend puts this blueprint out of a nice looking house. And I was like, oh, are you? Are you going to redesign your house? And she's like, no. I'm going to make a chocolate house for Valentine's Day. And you're like, oh. oh. Okay. That is pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, it kind of is. Uh, anyways. Um, they then talk to their, um, to their friend Midori, who is the cute one amongst the group. She's got blonde, nice hair. Yeah, uh, she's smart. She's popular, and they ask her about Valentine's Day, and they start kind of poking fun at her because mm -hmm. she gets all these chocolates, but she's never had a boyfriend. She yeah, well, and the as I recall, the tradition is uh, Valentine's Day. A girl gives chocolates to someone she likes, mm -hmm. and then White Day, which is a full month later which is uh, March, March 14th, 14th. Mm -hmm. it is the guy's responsibility to reciprocate, to give chocolates to the girls they like. But apparently Midori is on the receiving end of chocolates from both boys and girls. And so, like, in in sync, the uh, Tamako and her other friend say at the same time, Sugoi Midori, you're popular with both boys and girls. Mm -hmm. Word for word. Or, exact or same. Mm -hmm. Completely synchronized. It's like it's crazy. Um, and then at that point, we're kind of introduced to uh, Shiori. 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 Ah, I must have typed up. Yeah, Shiori. I did type of that in just one place. Um, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, plays badminton in mm -hmm. the badminton club, which is right next to uh, which means it's right next to their baton club. Their baton club. Mm -hmm. And so these mm -hmm. cheerleaders are in the baton club and uh, Shiori's in the badminton club and she's rehearsing and playing with this, um, uh, playing with badminton and the shuttlecock hits 
Tomiko right in the head. And I thought, this is the second birdie to hit Tomiko in the face. Gosh. So far. Yeah. And the like first, her friends first one like, being a bird, the second uh-huh. one being a birdie. Her friends make sure she's okay, but as soon as they make sure she's okay, it was like, that was incredible. That angle was just like, wow, pop, against your head. Yeah, let me see. And like, she shows her off the red mark and stuff. She, like, and she, and she, she already wants to apologize. And, and it's like, Tamako's like, no, no, it's my fault for my head being here. You're fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and we're in, and Shiori is it seems to be this incredibly elegant feminine person who in as I recall in Japanese culture, the more prim and proper you are, the less you say, the more uh the more reserved you seem to be. I mean there's there's like, I don't well, know if that's if that's a hundred percent accurate, but I can see where you're coming from. Right. You usually, uh huh. Especially well, in anime. That, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's that old adage that it's better to appear fo- It's better to stay silent and appear foolish than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Yep. And so, if you if everything that Aho Girl does demonstrates how much of an idiot she is. Quick to jump into situations, quick to say whatever's on her mind, regardless of how incorrect it is and re- involved in the situation, mm-hmm. and quick to become very physical in whatever situation she's in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then Shaori is the exact opposite. Shaori, mm-hmm. slow, slow to speak, slow to uh, get herself involved in anything, and kind of cool and aloof, seemingly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like. Throughout it, we see uh, we see uh, Tamako, you know, waving and trying to be friendly, and Shiori just always kind of turns away rather coldly. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we only really event. see her. We only really see her once in this episode. She comes into play a lot more in episode three. Yeah. Um, but that's really our first introduction with her. Um, and uh, they uh, so back to the Valentine's Day episode. Um, mm-hmm. She. Um, in the morning, she told her dad about, you know, her dad found, obviously, the heart mochi in his miso soup. Um, and she, you know, says, we should make that and sell it for Valentine's Day. And he's just like, mochi is mochi. Mochi doesn't celebrate Valentine's Day. Mochi's fine the way it is. And she's just like, oh, fine. Uh, but anyways, she comes back after school that day. Yep. Um, and she sees that their arcade, their little shopping district there's nothing at all for Valentine's Day. And she's like, we need to get into this more. So she has this really, she and, um, and uh, Mochizo, they, uh, being childhood friends that live across the street from each other, they have a way of communicating with each other. They he do. woke up, apparently he was napping or something. He was still in his uniform. He woke up bedhead and everything. And he, he, you hear this kind of weird clapping noise. He looks outside and he sees uh, Tomoko clapping and then holding a, her, her, her hands over her mouth like a cup. And he's like, okay, okay. He goes over to his, uh, to his uh, dresser, uh-huh. opens it up, removes a shirt, and pulls out a, um, a communication cup. device. Yep. Cups and a string. Cups, Cups in a string. And I was so jealous of this because I always wanted a friend living close by that I could do that with. Yes. It, it always seems so useful in the movies and stuff, but in real life, no, it doesn't work yeah, that way. Yeah, the, it, it requires a very specific set of, uh, set of events to work. It needs mm-hmm. to be a straight line yeah. from one to the other. The string needs to be secured to the bottom of the cup in a way that the vibrations of the string resonate and cause the sound to travel Mm -hmm. and needs Um, to be taught and there can't be anything on the string um but he puts some clay or something in the bottom of her cup because it's labeled hers mine Uh and he chucks hers across the street and she goes to catch it and it slams her in the head that's the it's third a thing paper, to hit it's in the a head. paper cup, so it doesn't hurt. No. And she's not mad at him because she knows it's her fault for not catching it. Yeah. But yeah, that's the third time that fourth. something's just... Fourth. fourth okay, time. so, so, so there, there's the baton, the yeah. bird, the shuttlecock, and the cup. So that's the fourth thing to hit her in the head. Fourth thing to hit her in the head. <laughs> at least. Uh, 
and and they and they communicate through and he's like what's going on and she wants to talk about doing something for valentine's day and how they need to have a meeting and like make this place all nice for valentine's day mm, and he of yeah. course gets a little bit nervous talking to the girl that he likes about valentine's day and he's like okay so what's your idea and she starts talking and suddenly it stops he can't hear anything and he looks out and there's the bird there is dedu sitting on the cord sitting on the string staring right at him with don't with a, a look that's like don't you dare talk to my woman type <laughs> thing and uh who do you think you yeah, are who do you think you are and, and he starts dancing on uh -huh. the string just he's, going back and forth enjoying the fact that he's causing these problems uh-huh and then suddenly the string starts shaking and he falls off and at this point he was very very slender in the first episode yes he was and then like we we didn't me mention this but it's starting to become cold it's starting to get autumn uh -huh. when he uh first meets the girl yeah He's like, well, I guess this is okay for me to stay here as long as I leave before New Year's and go continue on my journey to visit the princess. Bam. And then, bam, New Year's Eve, several months later. And he's just scarfing down mochi, and he has gained a lot of weight. And, and from he, here on out, he's he, a very plump, he, he, round bird that cannot fly. Anytime he looks in the mirror, he tells himself that he has beautiful plumage and that it's coming really fluffy this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... Anytime you ask Tomiko, she's like, yeah, he's fat. Because mm -hmm. all he does is he scarfs down mochi without even chewing. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff that's happening with that. And so, yeah, he's... I, I don't know if it changes too much between episodes, but there are just certain shots that make it look like he's just getting fatter and fatter with every episode that goes on. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're currently at the point where if he wants to fly, you got to dangle a cake in front of him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. Like the fat Chocobo in Final Fantasy XIV. Yes. I really want to get back into that game. But anyway, um, so uh, okay, so he so he falls off because uh, because uh, uh, Mochizo has shake sh shook the cup yeah. to shake the screen the the string, and he's like, "Sorry, that bird was in the way. Can you tell me what happened again?" As opposed to letting it be a typical anime moment of the girl getting angry. Oh, you weren't paying attention. Blah 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 blah. That, yeah, no, he could. She's hear. way too nice for that. Yeah, no, she's she, yeah, she's not that type of character. She's like, and he just says, "Sorry, the bird was on it, so I couldn't hear what you were saying. Can you say it again?" And she's just like, "Oh yeah, sure," and lets him know that she wants to do something nice for Valentine's And that summarizes that they decide mm -hmm. they're going to go to the rabbit bathhouse as mm -hmm. the the entire neighborhood's going to the rabbit bathhouse to have a uh, a meeting well, about what's going to happen. Like, on the way home, she says, "What do you want to do for Valentine's Day?" I said, oh, we don't really, we don't really celebrate it, but you know, we should probably do something about it, you know. And she goes to the I think uh, the I don't think it's the butcher. I don't I didn't catch what he sold, but this guy who's a little bit chubby. He's just like and she's like, well, what would you like? What would you like for Valentine's Day? And he's like, well, I I really really like chocolate from from and I didn't write her name down, but but from the girl that runs uh, the rabbit bathhouse, you know. Yeah. And then later on in that episode, when they're in the meeting and she's serve that that girl is serving tea to everybody, mm. he just blushes and it was it was it was cute seeing yeah. uh, seeing that reaction. Yeah, um, and serious crush on and uh, she noticed, like, there was a very obvious, like, she wasn't mean about it. She wasn't like, oh, you know, or anything like that. She didn't hold him over him in any way, but it's pretty obvious that she noticed. Um, anyway, uh, they have their meeting and she talks about how she wants to go ahead and celebrate Valentine's and everyone's talking about, oh, we can do this, we can do that. And her dad's just like, no, uh, -uh we're a mochi shop. We don't celebrate Valentine's, you know. You guys can do what you like. Mm -hmm. Oh, people are people. That oh don't include me. That none, none of this involves me. And there's a running gag that starts right here. We're like, okay, you're the one who called the meeting. Um, um, uh, Tama Chan, they call her. So how uh -huh. about you go ahead and and tell us what's going on? And so she's like, oh, okay, okay. And she stands up, and her face completely changes. Her eyes completely change. Her face actually reminds me of the faces, uh, the face of the main girl in um. In uh oh that anime we watched that was about dragon dragon pilots dragon oh, pilot or yes. it was called yeah it looked exactly like that person's face which uh -huh. is not the typical style for this show yeah. and like she all her words were all caps in the subtitles and she was pretty much just shouting trying to uh yeah she seemed very mechanical on. and very nervous and like Amako go ahead and just calm down it's fine I'll take care of it says uh uh, Mo uh Mochizo. Mochizo. 
and yeah. he does the exact same thing. And then he's like, and then the owner, the old man who's the owner of the bathhouse, he's just like, kids, 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 it's fine. Don't worry about it. I'll tell everybody. And he does the exact same thing. Yes. And everyone's just like, you're an old man. You don't have an excuse to be nervous. <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. And then in the next episode, it's the beginning of the new school year where they're second years, I believe. Um, and they uh and like when she's introducing herself, it's the exact same thing again, where she's just super nervous talking in front of everybody. Um, and it's the exact same face, exact same um uh yeah, so, so, so chronologically, the events of episode three start with um uh, okay. Dara the bird falls out of a tree or off of a fence or something and some and Shiori catches him on her badminton badminton racket mm -hmm. and then realizes how heavy he is and has to set him down so Gosh, yeah yeah well, well um, and, and, three, isn't sees, it? and so when he sees her when Dara sees Shiori he turns from white to pink Mm -hmm. and so a full body blush he's smitten with this girl mm -hmm. and wants to spend as much time as he can with her mm -hmm. and that that set up something that's paid off near the end of the episode yeah um then we go to the uh it, uh, we're, we're seeing that it's a new school year or a new school well, semester or whatever there's, it is whatever there's still stuff right. about valentine's that we skipped like talking about them making they make a commercial right, for it that's that. Uh, they make the they make the commercial and that's that and that kind of helps develop um, the blonde friend. Um, you oh, know, I, was, she's, she, I was just getting up to yeah. the uh, the class introductions that happened in episode three, but yeah, oh, we yeah, but, things, but so. and then like I, I one thing I did want to point out, and we can go ahead and go to the class introdu introductions after this, is that um, the father, um, um, Kamiko's father, realizes how important this is to his daughter, and he ends up giving in, and he makes mochi in the shape of hearts and he puts chocolate in them and he gives them to his daughter. The first one's to his daughter and she immediately just starts laughing. She, and she, she just came home she, so yeah. much uh -huh. that, it, that it fills her with such joy that she can't help uh -huh. but giggle. Uh -huh. And he, he gets, you know, blushing fun of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, I, um, and that's after they they filmed the commercial. And then they show the commercial to everybody. Well, and she's like, no, 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 it's great, it's great, it's great. And then they show the commercial, because it's not even Valentine's Day yet. They show the commercial, but the, the equipment, the projector is not working. They don't know why. Yes. And I, I need to take care of that later. Sorry, receipt was in my pocket. Um, and uh, they, uh, the bird's just like, here, let me see this. And he grabs the audio, uh, the, the uh, visual cable, the yellow one. Uh -huh. Puts it in his mouth and becomes a projector. Yes. He just and we, catch, we catch a glimpse of this in episode one where his eyes project something onto the ceiling. And they're like, wait, mm -hmm. what? End of episode. And then cut away and, or end of episode or something. And we don't really figure out what's going on. And this one it delves a bit more into it. And so he's he's running the projector and he's able to show the entirety of the commercial. And the commercial is looking great. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the commercial, we start to see a bit about Dara himself. We see his uh, relationship with... Um, uh, we see that there's a, a uh, dark-skinned islander um, mm -hmm. motif uh, mm -hmm. character who seems to be a prince. And he's talking to Dara in, uh, in the first person and asking him how he's doing and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So it's a question of, okay, is this a broadcast? Is this a, a memory? And he's talking and he's preparing to record something and he's talking directly to the mm -hmm. bird. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a lovely young lady about the same age as the young prince uh, beh standing beh mm -hmm. back into the side. She seems to be a servant of some part. She was up front first and uh -huh. then she quickly moved behind the prince. So I think like whatever they were using to communicate with him, uh, with the bird or record whatever message this is, she's the one who turned it on and then like went back, kind of showing that she's a, a servant of the prince. Right. That's kind of the vibe that I got from it. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So based on the information that they give us in the first three episodes, it seems that the bird is on a quest to find a girlfriend for this character, and he's, he's trying to find the princess for that for that prince for that mm -hmm. prince. And it's at that, that moment that you know in the background we kind of see. Um, uh, we see um, 
Midori kind of a bit romantic, a bit smitten, putting her face in her chin, her, her chin in her hands. Uh, as as they're watching this, like which one? Which I, friend is Midori again? Is she the blonde? Uh, she's the blonde. Okay, she's the blonde that's popular with boys uh-huh. and girls. Hmm. Um. And she's the one who, as I was getting to, they. I, I, it's April. It's the start of a new year, a new a new semester or something, and uh, new classes are assigned. And so mm-hmm. everybody's outside looking at the. Um, in episode three, everybody's outside looking at uh, what charts are what, uh-huh. and it turns out that Midori, for the first time in forever, is not going to be in their cl- in yeah Tamako and the other friends' class. Mm-hmm. But Shiori is. Yeah, mm-hmm. and. And we also so, learned that uh, Mizo, Mo, 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 Mochi Zhu, uh, his name is not that hard for me to remember, but I keep uh, saying it wrong. Mochi Zhu, he's depressed because he's not in uh, Tamako's class yes. again. again. So apparently he's never in her class. So, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so. And, and then the class introductions happen and the uh-huh. person in the, the, uh, front seat closest to the windows is um shiori and she gives a Mm -hmm. what turns out to be an incredibly well rehearsed introduction to herself Uh and um talks about who she is and how she's in the badminton club Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um then sits down and then it goes through various people and then it gets to tamako's turn and like that running gag you mentioned earlier she starts talking with the robotic uh, i i mean and I'm this, this, and this. And she's about to sit down, which is like, oh, and I'm also in the... Um, the Baton Club. The Baton Club, that's right. There's my kitty. And then her friend behind her mentions she's also in the Baton Club. And, um, yeah, every time every time they catch a glimpse of Shiori and try to say hi to her, Shiori is cold, turns away too quickly and is cold and ignores them. And, um, and various things happen. But... Uh, because Dara is in love with Shiori after school, he finds a way of falling in front of her again. This time she catches him with whatever she seems to have she, a, she got a, a sealed she got a package form. from a, from a, a bookstore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a manila package of some kind. Catches him with that, like, oh, it's still heavy, and has mm-hmm. to let him down on the ground. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. eventually he talk he talks to her. He's like, Why can you talk, bird? Yeah, why, why is this happening? Uh, and then the bird introduces himself, and she introduces herself, and he starts flirting with her and saying how pretty a name she has, and maybe you could take me home because I'm really weak and I can't really carry myself now. Mm-hmm. And so he tricks her into taking her all the way over to Tomiko's house. Well, he actually did get lost. Like he did yes, he... get lost uh, while he was tailing her. Uh-huh. And then he sees her again coming out of the bookstore, and that's when he's like, "Oh, let me go and do this." And then he falls in front of her face again. So yeah, and but so, he did he did get lost. And so, but he takes her to Tomiko's place. And before they get to Tomiko's place, they're in the arcade, uh-huh. and everybody knows the bird, and so everybody's willing to become friends with this girl because the bird is kind of an icebreaker. They for automatically them. assume that she's Tomiko's friend. Automatically, yep. mm-hmm. and so they're they're giving her free stuff. The florist gives her a flower. The um. Uh, the, the 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 croquet shop gives her a free croquet and and it's delicious and she's just mm-hmm. is amazed at how great everything is and then she ends up uh, trying to drop off um, Dara uh, Dara at uh, Tamako's place mm-hmm. and Tamako says well stick around for tea like I can't stay for tea well I've got some mochi uh, we make it here let me hit, let me serve you some because it's it's springtime so we, right now we have sakura mochi they have cherry flavored mochi. Mm-hmm. And so they, um, and so she agrees to stick around, and she does, and like she gets a text from her mom about her mom's how, how her mom's staying late, and she'll have to make her own dinner, and so she stays for dinner and has dinner with them, and ends up going bathing with uh, Tamako and her little sister, and they have a huge fun time together the whole time, and she already even pro- bake, makes the dinner. She's she's the best cook out of everybody there, and she actually makes some kind of uh, uh, cabernet, like like some uh, like I don't know what what it is specifically. It looks like bacon bits in spaghetti. Mm-hmm. 
And that might be what Cabaneri is, but uh, it's some it's some kind of yeah. Insane. I've I've seen it uh, several times in anime. I've never looked it up myself, but it's like it's uh it's uh, it's a type of pasta. It's a type yeah. of pasta that has I think like bacon in it. You know, let's let's look it up. Why not carbonara? Yeah, carbonara. Carbonara. Uh, I know that carn okay, in yeah. Spanish is uh, is uh, meat. So, uh huh. Okay, so yeah, usually it has um, uh, a hard cheese, um, black pepper, and um, egg. So yeah. Yeah, and then it looks like it usually has uh, bacon or some other kind of pork with it, from what I'm seeing. Okay. But, meh, anyway. Well, all right. Yeah. But yeah, she, she makes them, she makes dinner, and the little sister, uh, Anko, helps, and mm -hmm. everything's going great, and everything's just a wonderful experience, and, uh, and then Shiori goes home. Yeah, well, yeah, they they go to the bathhouse. They do a whole bunch of other things together, and yeah, and then Shiori goes home. Yeah. Um, and then the next day at school, um, Tamako's just like, "Hey, hey, what? yesterday was a whole lot of fun. Thank you so much." And she like walks up to her at her desk, and Shiori gets up and just walks away. Just gets up, doesn't say a word, walks away. Walks right out of the mm -hmm. right, right out of the room and into a bathroom. Uh -huh. And, and uh, we we. Well, Real fast before that, I'm going to let you get right to that. Uh -huh. um, Tamako goes and talks to her her friend, the one who's still with her, um, uh, the one who made the the chocolate house. Right. Um, and she's like, oh, oh, oh what happened? Well, her friend says, what happened? He's like, oh, yesterday I spent a lot of time with her, but I guess maybe, you know, I was I was rushing things too much and, you know, maybe I offended her, you know? And then, then we cut to the bathroom. And we cut to the so, bathroom yeah. and we see Shiori in the, in the mirror practicing saying thank you so much i had fun too over and over again just trying different expressions and trying to make it seem as natural as possible and then we realize because she's doing this she's shy and it made me think of uh comey can't communicate yeah it made me think that too which you've read and i haven't yet and i need to mm -hmm. um but yeah, she ran to the bathroom to rehearse saying a thank you to her. And uh, that's when, uh, I think that's when, uh, I think it's Midori who walks in on her and she stops practicing and walks away shyly again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, her friend walks in, the blonde, uh, walks in and she goes away, puts her glasses back on and walks out shyly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of things happen in quick succession in this episode, um, mm -hmm. but eventually, um, uh, Dara gets Shiori to take him back to Tamako's place again. The bird gets the shy girl to take her back to the mochi girl's house. Um, and, uh, while there... I think she invites her out to tea or something like that. And mm -hmm. then they, they they say something to the effect of, um, well, no, as I rec what happened was the bird asks Shiori out on a date. Mm -hmm. And then Tamako injects herself into the situation and says, yeah, we should absolutely go out and get, get tea. Let's go get coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's absolutely go get coffee. And then the bird's like, well, <laughs> Like, oh. and, and, and then I don't remember the exact the way it was phrased, but Tomiko mentions, in fact, you don't have to come at all, uh, Dara. Yeah. In fact, you're kind of annoying. Yeah. And then, and then Dara turns to Shiori, hoping that she has feelings for him too, and that she'll insist that he comes. And in her shyness, Shiori just kind of goes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and and so Dara's just standing there going, Uh-huh. What just what just happened? So he asked this girl out on a date, and now the girl he asked out and the girl he's living with have left him and he's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so they go get coffee. 
Um, and we've we've seen uh, this coffee coffee shop a couple of times. It's a coffee shop that's got a big collection of records. Yes. Um, and apparently this 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 uh, the coffee shop owner he's a he's a kind of a quiet guy. He prefers you know communicating through music than through words. And uh, at we kind of revealed earlier we did skip over this just a little bit, but it's yeah. fine. Um, yeah, there's Tomoko's a lot of little mother, things that happen. Yeah, Tomoko's mother passed away when she was five, and Tomoko's looking for the song that her mother used to sing yes um and, and so, she can't remember what that song is she, she can so hum this guy's trying to kind of help trying to help her find it yeah she's she can hum a part of the tune and so they, mm -hmm. they he keeps going through music and trying to find if he can find that tune and like mm -hmm. is this it no and so and so for the last i guess 10 years they haven't been able to find mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. find it but so yeah. they um so uh, they kind of open up over this coffee. Um, yes. And uh, she is about to apologize for overstepping her bounds mm -hmm. when finally Tom, uh, finally a Shiori is just like, she opens up and says, thank you. I had so much fun yesterday, you know? Yeah. Um, and kind of... And which, they, mm -hmm. which her immediate... Which causes... Uh... Tomiko, to, her initial reaction is shock because she didn't. Re, she thought Shiori was a much more put together, much more elegant person, and didn't expect her to be this shy person that she turned out to be. And so initially, it's shock on her face, and seeing shock on her face, Shiori then proceeds to hide behind whatever package she happened to be holding, and just deeply embarrassed because she said something and this and it got an unexpected response. And so, and then we see just how kind-hearted Tomiko is, and just realizes, oh, my expression was wrong, and and so she 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 pushes the package down and has a gentle smile on her face, and they become friends. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's just it's, it's this beautiful moment that is incredibly well animated. It's just the subtlest mm -hmm. motion. It kind of reminded me a little bit of you know when when Ghibli intensity and hair starts to to rise on end. Mm -hmm. it, was, it it wasn't exactly that. But it was similar, where where the motion was, they took the time to animate the slightest change in elevation, the way someone uh -huh. was sitting or the way someone was looking, and it was beautiful to watch. It really mm -hmm. was. There, there was a real yeah. class to the animation in this mm -hmm. scene. And, uh, yeah, and it was a great scene. They decided that they're going to be friends. Um, and uh, as they go their separate ways for the night, Detta tries to declare his love for Shiori by giving him one of his favorite feathers. And he's and he's just like, here, take this. And she's just like, doesn't say anything, just kind of turns, turns around and walks. Uh, walks I swear away. she said something like, I don't play badminton because I like feathers. Oh, that's right. Yeah, something like, that's right. She did say that. She said, I don't play badminton because I like feathers. And he's like, He's just kind of crushed, and this feather, like she just kind of turns around and walks home. Mm -hmm. He just kind of takes his feather and just puts it back. <laughs> yeah, just right back in his wings. Uh -huh. And earlier, when he's trying to flirt with her, he's talking about, of course, himself, and he says that his favorite feathers are these ones right here, and he kind of points to the ones, one of the ones that he tries giving her later. Yeah. Um, but we did forget to say this earlier. Um, when he got super fat, well, well af after he got super fat with Mochi, yeah. because he's still fat, yeah. um, the dad, uh, Tomoko's dad, tells him to change his name from Mochi Mazui, which means, you know, Mochi is disgusting, uh, to Mochi Umai, which means Mochi is delicious. Yes. And <laughs> dad is just like, no, Mochi Mazui is a wonderful, dignified name. <laughs> It's a oh, dignified yeah. royal family name. You can't take that from me. As he's stuffing his face with more mochi. <laughs> like, yeah. He, he just doesn't see the connection or something. Mm -hmm. It's just so yeah. silly. He's just stat full of himself. Anyway, that's kind of the first three episodes. It is. Um, and so it's a charming anime. It's well animated, especially through very emotional sequences. Um, not, a lot, not a whole lot of action. or It's just not that kind of anime. Uh -huh. But it's 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 a kind of a fantasy. It's a fantastical slice of life, 
-hmm. that is uh, a whole lot of fun. Slice of life with fantasy elements, we can say. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I definitely think I'm going to watch more, as we were saying earlier. It's uh, It kind of fills up my alley, just kind of laid back, um, and something I feel like I can unwind to. Um, but again, that's just the first three episodes. I have no idea what's going to happen here later on in the future. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts? I like it. I don't know that... I mean, it, it, was, it was fun. It was interesting. I don't know that it's... It's something that I'll go back to, to be honest. I mean, maybe I will. It depends. Mm-hmm. But uh, there, there's just some other things we've already watched this season that I that I want to go in and finish first. Okay, and so this is this well, is like a back burner list for me. Yes, well, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to make it a priority just because I'm still really behind on this season's anime that I really, really want to really want to watch. I just haven't had the time to watch them myself, but I definitely want to continue with this show. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's it for this week's bit. Next week we're continuing continuing with uh, Kill Annie Month, and you yep. picked this next up this next show. So what are we going to watch? Okay, next week we're going to watch a show titled Love, Chunibyo, and Other Delusions. Okay, so here's the uh, synopsis from Crunchyroll. Yuta Togashi has a problem. He used to be a Chunibyo one of the thousands of Japanese students so desperate to stand out that they've literally convinced themselves that they have secret knowledge and hidden powers. But now that he's starting high school, he's determined to put aside his delusions and face life head on. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, Rika Takanashi, his upstairs neighbor, is just a bit delusional herself, and she knows all about his past indiscretions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So this is going to be a lot of fun. And there's plenty of memes based on this show. And I I'm aware like it's, it's that girl, it's the girl with the short blue hair and an eye patch on all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like a clip where he throws a piece of paper at her and she tries to catch it between her fingers and misses and it hits her in the eye anyway. (laughs) Works for me. Uh, But yeah, there's, uh, and uh, I swear, I mean, there's this gif. Where you see the girl with the eye patch, and she's just. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! That gets all over the place. So I think that. So we'll see if that's in the first three episodes or not. Okay. But, but yeah, this mm-hmm. this show is definitely a uh, a source of memes. Yeah. Okay. Well, awesome. I'm looking forward to watching it, and we're going to be watching it on Crunchyroll. Yep. Um. But anyways, that's it for three episodes in. Let's go ahead and move on to uh to recommendation of the week. And yes. this is a show we are going to be watching for three episodes in at some point. But I have currently read all of the manga. Um, and holy crap, it is awesome. I told you about this. You did. We um, were out um, together grabbing some food or something. Grabbing some dinner, yep. Mm-hmm. And you were mentioning and this one. This is Boarding School Juliet. It is Shakespeare... In manga form. And I don't mean to say, you know, it is on the level of Shakespeare, but mm-hmm. it is heavily inspired by Shakespeare to the point to where some of the protect some of Romeo's friends are Shakespearean level idiots. So this, this takes place in a school that's on an island in between two nations that have been hostile for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. Um, there is the West, which is a European culture, and then there is uh, to- 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 Towa or something like that. I'll have to double check. I didn't write down the name, but that's the Orient. It's not just Japan, but there's also some Korean influences and some Chinese influences in their culture. Um, but that's pretty much the Orient, and the two sides hate each other. Mm-hmm. Well, as a mark of peace, they signed a they signed a peace treaty that is tenuous at best. Um, that hair off my screen um they have this school where uh the two sides send students and students who go to this school end up being fairly important people in their home countries mm-hmm. um well romeo is the leader of the black dogs the 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 Toans are their 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 um their coat of arms is a black dog uh-huh. whereas the west their coat of arms is the white cat. So it is uh, 
Huh, okay. Um, it is their... Uh... So, yeah. So, so, so they, fight like, so they, fight like they fight like cats and, and, like cats and dogs. dogs. They fight yeah. like cats and dogs. And Juliet is the leader of the white cats. Of wow. their every, every, every year in school, there's somebody who's the strongest and therefore the leader. Mm -hmm. And Romeo has been in love with Juliet ever since grade school. But he can't do anything about it because... He would be viewed as a traitor. Mm. Um, so he has decided that he will, you know, he'll, he'll that rather than, um, you know, hurt Juliet um, by making, you know, by letting her know that a black dog's in love with her and by hurting the reputation of the black dogs, he decides that he's just going to go ahead and live with it that he's just going to live with this love for her and never declare it. However, Juliet has noticed in all of their clashes, he's holding back. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when she's in danger, he actually rushes in and fights her himself instead of the other people. And the reason he's doing this is because he wants to make sure she doesn't get hurt by them. But she views it as him seeing her as weak. And kind of going with the Shakespearean level of idiots, some people try to kidnap her and they put... They put burlap sacks over their heads so they're in disguise, but they forgot to cut holes in them. So they're walking around like this trying to kidnap Juliet. It's hysterical. And these guys are great. These guys are so great. Um, okay. Sometimes the idiots are the wisest people in a Shakespearean play. Sometimes. Okay? Especially in a comedy. And sometimes. this is not a tragedy. This is a romantic comedy. Uh -huh. But that night, Romeo gets a letter from Juliet saying, meet me here at this fountain at midnight. And he's like, wait, is she confessing? Oh, wait, no, no, definitely not. There's no way she cares. There's no way she feels that way about me. This is probably just her wanting to fight. And so he goes and Juliet is standing there with two broadswords. Mm -hmm. And she hands him a broadsword and says, you don't take me seriously. I want you to come at me and be completely honest with me and show me how you really feel about me. Mm -hmm. and he's like are you seriously you want me to come completely at you and tell you how I really feel and she's like yes you will tell me exactly how you feel and you're gonna like we're gonna we're gonna finally fight this out between the two of us I'm sick of you not, not taking me seriously and he realizes that he's been hurting her this entire time by not fighting her seriously mm. because she's an incredibly strong person and he's just like, okay, you know what? Fine, let's do this. And so they clash. And as soon as the two swords hit, he leans in and says, I love you. Go out with me. <laughs> and how does she reply to that? She freaks out. Like she starts <laughs> blushing and stuff like that. But she starts coming back with all these arguments. Uh, now we can't like, what are you talking about? There's no way something like that would ever work out. You're an idiot. And he's like, I know I'm an idiot, but for you, I'd be willing to change the world. I see you working to change the world yourself every single day. And I will do whatever it takes to make sure that our love can be real. And she, she pushes him into the fountain after like screaming at him. Uh -huh. And uh, then she says, but that, that kind of a stupidity, I don't, I don't find it bad. So, uh, so show me, show me how you'll change the world. And they start uh, dating. They uh, start dating. And it's, it's it, I don't want to spoil anything for, I just well, want to Okay, obviously they that's, start that's dating. The first, that's I mean, the first chapter. I mean, obviously so. they're going to start dating. Their names are Romeo and Juliet. That's not spoiling mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. But they, like, there's great bits where they, they they try to meet in secret, but like they'll be near a rose bush, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. some white cats are coming along, and so Juliet will grab Romeo and hurl him into the rose bushes to hide him, and then other times, you know, black dogs will be coming around, and he will grab Juliet and throw her into a sewer or something like that to keep them from being seen together. Mm -hmm. So. It's it's awesome. It's so good. Um, there's some absolutely adorable parts to it. All the characters are great and memorable. Um, yeah, I highly recommend it. There's an anime version of it. I definitely want us to watch it when we get the chance. Um, okay. And uh, it looks like you already put a link here for it. Yeah, Boarding School Juliet. Um, yeah, this... Uh,
Okay. 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 I mean, I'll... <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it's a great show. So that's it for recommendation great. of the week. Let's move on to creator shout out, which is your turn. All right. It's my turn this week. And all right. This creator was found uh, in a little bit of a silly way. Um, I found on Twitter a bot that pretends to be Sailor Mercury. Gosh. And we'll just randomly tweet things. And one of the things she randomly tweeted was sarcat was a uh, a criticism of Usagi of Sailor Moon that reading and walking at the same time is dangerous and you should never do it. And so I was determined to go out and find a picture of Sailor Mercury reading reading and walking and call her a hypocrite, just because I thought it'd be funny to do. So I went out looking for pictures of Sailor Mercury reading and walking, and I found. A picture that I showed you, which is where she's actually sitting down and reading, but it's this adorable little doodle of her. Mm-hmm. And I and I absolutely adored it. And then I found I looked in this fine print, and it was written, drawn by an artist who calls herself Little Digits. And so I looked her up, and I found her Instagram, Tumblr, uh, personal website, and Twitter accounts. And she's done a lot of adorable little sketches. Um, one of the and one I had seen ages ago, and I was really glad I found it again, was um, a picture that I shared with you as well. It was uh, Froppy and the bird guy from My Hero Academia walking in the rain, and he's holding an umbrella, and she has no problem being out from under the umbrella, splashing in the puddles. Mm-hmm. And it's just this adorable little sketch, and yeah, all all of these sketches are just fantastic, and I um. Okay. And so, yeah, my shout out is to Megan Ferguson, aka Little Digits. She, her work is amazing and she deserves it. She deserves a shout out. So, everybody listening to this podcast should absolutely go find her on Twitter and start following yeah. her. Okay. Well, this has been a long episode. So, let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thanks so much for, for tuning in this week. If you listened on YouTube, please feel free to like this episode and subscribe to our channel. If you like what you do and want to support us, please share our channel with your friends. Uh, where can they find us on social media? Our site, WhitakerWeekly.com, currently has the links to our Facebook page, Twitter account, and YouTube channel. We encourage all our listeners to follow us on the social media platform of their preference, and if there's one we're not on yet, please reach out to us on one of the ones we've mentioned, and we'll broaden our scope to include you. All right. Well, I've been Andrew. I've been Lee. And this has been Whitaker Weekly. You guys have a great week.